Uh, I was told to talk about uh, ischemic VT ablation, and I thought that I would probably start up by uh, presenting a very small case and see how it, uh, where, where are the questions that we can ask ourselves about the case. So, 63-year-old male, ischemic cardiomyopathy, remote anterior wall MI with an LVF residual of 25%, prior history of ventricular tachycardia for which he was treated with amiodarone, and sure enough, they put a, an ICD in that patient then. So, question number one, did he need an ablation then or no? Finally, I end up getting off the amiodarone because of some side effects and presents with recurrent VT, which as we know, if you, have, if you try to die once, you're going to try to die again, and uh, with recurrent ICD shocks. Has not had any chest pain, and he's on uh, essentially guideline-directed medical therapy uh, without any problem. So what I would like to talk is that, you know, what is scar-related VT in the setting of ischemic cardiomyopathy? What are some of the ablation strategy that we've been uh, seeing over the past 20 years? And I'm an old timer, so I'm going to stress on the old ways of doing VT ablation. And then uh, talk a little bit about the timing of ablation. When do we do a, a, a VT ablation? When is the right time to do it? So first of all, we know that if you have uh, uh, VT, sustained VT, this is a class one indication to put an ICD. Um, ICDs will, uh, do not prevent uh, VT, but ICDs uh, prevent sudden death at its best. Uh, VT ablation uh, prevent VT, but VT ablation do not prevent uh, sudden death on the long term. So kind of a very fine uh, equilibrium between the two. So right now, catheter ablation for VT is an adjunctive treatment option uh, in addition to ICD for patients who have recurrent ventricular tachycardia, uh, despite the fact that uh, they are on suppressive antiarrhythmic uh, medication. But uh, we know that ICD prevents, as I said, sudden death, but they do not prevent the arrhythmia. Actually, uh, if you, there's been a lot of uh, uh, talks about uh, patients who have ICDs and have recurrent ICD shocks. Those patients actually have a threefold increase in mortality over uh, on long-term follow-up. And, and you wonder, there's always been that debate whether is it the ICD shock and the therapy that is increasing their mortality, or is it because they have a bad substrate, substrate and therefore they have ventricular tachycardia, that this is the reason why they have a, a higher mortality. Not only that, patients who have ICD, if they have ICD shocks, uh, then they suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder, the quality of life is messed up, and we need to do something about that. Now, what is it that we can do? Well, the first thing that comes to mind is what, are the, what is the role of medication in the situation? Um, there's been several trials, and this is just one of the trials, the OPTIC trial that randomized patient to either beta blocker, uh, sorolol, or amiodarone plus beta blocker, and sure enough, the best regimen to suppress ventricular arrhythmia, down to 73% actually suppression in ICD shock, was the combination of amiodarone of beta blocker. Yet, Amiodarone does not affect mortality or survival in patients with ischemic cardiomyopathy. Kind of the same story of atrial fibrillation. Is it the amiodarone that is increasing their mortality, or is it the fact that suppressing ventricular tachycardia with medication does not actually do anything to their uh, mortality because they have a bad substrate, and this is why they have ventricular arrhythmia? So let's talk about what else besides medication. What do we have? Well, we have possibility of an ablation. And in, I know that uh, Elad is going to talk about non-ischemic uh, ventricular tachycardia ablation. So it's a little bit different in ischemic uh, VT ablation. Ischemic ventricular tachycardia is predominantly scar-related. The scar is predominantly on the endocardial surface rather than on the epicardial surface because it's the way the ischemia progresses in somebody who has a myocardial infarct. Um, and if you look at this here, you can see that, oh no, this, does this show? No, okay. So if you look at this, you, you, the, the, the scar that happens with the myocardial infarction, it is believed that within the scar there are surviving uh, myocytes that, are poor, that have poor cell-to-cell -cell connection that can account for slowing the conduction. And slowing the conduction is one of the main prerequisites, actually, to have a reentrant circuit. And that can form a region why you have a reentrant ventricular tachycardia, usually at the border zone of the scar. So in the past, when before the re reperfusion era, patients used to have a myocardial infarct, they have a dense scar, they might have few channels within the scar, and that can actually predispose to ventricular, uh, reentrant ventricular tachycardia. But in the era of reperfusion, be it 
PCI or uh, thrombolytics, you can see that the scar is a little bit mottled, and therefore the channels are not as much have slowing of the conduction and what have you. So we are seeing less VT, but when you see a VT, those VTs tend to be much faster than in the old uh, era. And obviously those scars can be endocardial predominantly, but even in ischemic cardiomyopathy sometimes, the vulnerable part of the circuit for ablation can be on the epicardial or intramural uh, aspect of the uh, myocardium. So if we believe that catheter ablation of reentrant VT is dependent on that scar, and the idea is how can we determine or identify that critical isthmus where there is a slow conduction so that if we target that isthmus for ablation, we can actually get rid of the ventricular tachycardia uh, that the patient is presented with. Well, we have several ways that we do it in the lab, and that's the old way uh, since Mark Josephson, the late Mark Josephson, I actually described it a long time ago. And uh, um, well, I'm blanking on the name, uh, and uh, Dr. I'm like, on I'm sorry. Anyway, Stevenson, thank you very much. Um, so you look for mid-diastolic potentials during VT, you pace and you look for concealed entrainment, you measure the stem to QRS and the EGM to the QRS, and you look for the post-pacing interval. This is all something that we do to know that our catheter is actually within the isthmus, and what we do in this situation is that we ablate and the ventricular tachycardia goes away. This is an activation map of the, our patients who came in and went to ventricular tachycardia um, ablation. You can see in this situation that there's a figure of eight reentrant uh, arrhythmia or reentrant circuit, and you can see at each step of the way what is the quality of the electrogram that we see in terms of mid-diastolic potential at the exit site or at the entry site of uh, this circuit. But nevertheless, we do our usual maneuvers. So this patient has this ventricular tachycardia, and what we do is that you can see that there is a mid-diastolic potential, very abnormal activation of the ventricle uh, right in the middle of diastole. We pace, and you can see that the pacing QRS is the same as actually the ventricular tachycardia QRS. Uh, concealed entrainment, so you measure the stem to QRS is equal to the EGM to the QRS. The pace pacing interval is exactly the same as the VVT cycle length. This is the perfect, actually, example that you are in that isthmus, protected isthmus, with your ablation catheter. You ablate there, and poof, the tachycardia goes away. That's the most rewarding thing that you can have when you are in uh, the EP lab. But to, for this to happen, the patient has to have a ventricular tachycardia that is mappable, meaning that you are able to sustain tachycardia and you are able to map the tachycardia while the patient is hemodynamically stable. If he's hemodynamically unstable, you cannot do that. Which means that this takes us to the other ways to try to map this ventricular tachycardia in patients who you cannot sustain VT or in patients when they go into VT, they bottom down their blood pressure and you cannot have enough time to map. Or you induce a VT and you induce another VT and you have now three or four VTs that you induce and you do not know which one to target. Or you induce a VT and it starts changing on you when you do entrainment mapping. So those patients are hard to do it to map the uh, usual, in the usual fashion. And what we need to do then is to understand the scar. So if most of these channels that we go after and ablate are within the scar, can we in some ways find those scars in normal rhythm and try to maybe identify areas that would be uh, amenable to ablation and reduce the recurrence rate of ventricular tachycardia? Yes, there is a possibility. Um, to define what is the scar, this is actually from Marchlinsky back from 2000, identifying the fact that if you measure the voltage within the endocardial surface of the left ventricle, usually the scar is less than 1.5 millivolt. The border zone is between 0.5 and 1.5, and the scar is less than 0.5. So you can identify an area where the infarction has happened. And if this is the usual way where we use a blade, identify the isthmus or the channel, and a blade to interrupt the circuit, well, it is a little bit different, different when we define the scar and try to do a scar modification. There are several ways that that scar can be modified. Well, you can say, since the ventricular tachycardia circuit, uh, the impulse is gonna exit at the border zone of the scar, why don't we pace all the way around and see which one looks like the VT and a blade in that location? Well, that's one way. Or, we can say, instead of pacing, and I do not waste my time pacing, why don't I just go all the way around the scar and do a scar modification by ablating circumferentially around the scar? Well, that is also a possibility. Or we can go around the scar and cribble the scar all the way 
kind of homogenize the scar so that you, know, you don't have any more channels in there. So this is all can be done, and this has been done actually as a scar, scar modification tool. And also you can use the quality of the intracardiac electrogram to define the channels. What is the isthmus surrogate in normal rhythm to see if I can identify those channels and ablate them? Well, I can look for late potentials because in normal rhythm, well, the impulse has to go around the scar and it's gonna go slowly inside the scar and it's gonna give me a late potential. And if I can identify that late potential, I ablate in that area and kind of do what we call a de-channeling ablation, if you want. Plug all the scar, all the channels so that you can interrupt the ventricular tachycardia. So this is also something that can be done. These are called isolated late potentials. And also there is something that is called lava or local active, uh, uh, local abnormal ventricular activation. And you can see those fractionated electrograms and these have actually specific definitions for these abnormal electrograms that one can go by and ablate those areas within the scar that uh, exhibit these kinds of abnormalities, try to as much as possible de-channel the ablation. And there are some newer things that are coming around the corner, especially with high density mapping where we have basket catheters and uh, all kinds of star catheters with multi-electrode whereby we can acquire lots of signals very quickly at the same time. And this is what we call an isochronal late activation map, which allows us to visualize the conduction velocity. Why do we want to visualize the conduction velocity? Because within the scar, there are areas that have intrinsically slowing of the conduction that we can identify. And these would be targeted for ablation because you need the slowing of the conduction to maintain a circuit. And if you get rid of the slowing of the conduction, then you can get rid of the reentrant arrhythmia. And what this allows us, what this is adding to what we know currently is that the latest activation within the scar are not necessarily the areas that we need to ablate. And I know that Ilad's gonna talk, this is uh, from Dr. Antar, he's, I know he's gonna talk to, uh, to us about that maybe a little bit uh, later, but with high resolution activation mapping, but this is during VT, not during normal sinus rhythm. He was able to actually redefine what we think about the isthmus, that those areas that surround that narrow channel are not necessarily scars and blocked areas as much as areas of slow conduction that are functional. And if we think that these are functional and not blocked areas, well, this means that what we are doing, when we are doing our map during normal rhythm, then those areas are not gonna manifest. So that puts into question the validity of doing mapping during normal rhythm or during pacing as opposed to mapping during uh, ventricular tachycardia. But this is all something that we are learning more and more about, circumferential ablation around the scar can be tedious. This, I remember this a case whereby we um, measured the circumference of the scar and it was close to 28 centimeters that we have to go all the way around and whatever if you're losing, you're leaving gaps in this situation or what have you. This is from Luigi, Natali's group, looking at homogenization of the scar from the inside and from the outside, epicardially and endocardially, and they were actually able to show that those patients have less recurrent ventricular tachycardia than if you do just limited scar modification from the endocardial surface. And this is also from uh, Luigi, who actually showed that if you do scar modification in normal rhythm and compare that to activation mapping and ablation, scar modification gives you a better outcome but this has to be validated actually in larger clinical uh, trials. This is the scar modification. Um, I don't want you to look at all this table. Just look at the recurrence rate using different kinds of scar modification. Despite all what we do, the recurrence rate is still up to 46% in several of these studies. But clearly, scar modification nowadays is gaining more traction and is being done more, um, uh, uh, increasingly more as compared to regular activation mapping. It might be because the fact that uh, the VTs that we're seeing nowadays are not stable VTs, and the patients that we are seeing today have multiple VT morphology, which actually takes us to do more scar modification and less so of uh, the conventional activation map and uh, ablation. Early recurrence of ventricular tachycardia following ablation is a bad sign. 
uh, there's an increased risk of uh, transplant and a higher uh, uh, risk of uh, mortality. So again, telling us that a recurrence of VT is a sign of a bad substrate, provided that you've done a good ablation, is a sign of a bad substrate. And those patients, even when you do VT ablation, those patients who have an ejection fraction of less than 30%, and those patients who had problems with congestive heart failure and what have you, they, the VT ablation does not affect their survival whatsoever. It might decrease the likelihood of ICD shock, it might decrease the likelihood of VT recurrence, but there is no effect on mortality with uh, VT ablation. So what is the best time to perform an ablation? Well, um, if VT ablation decreases the VT recurrence and decreases ICD shock, and ICD shock uh, uh, increases mortality, well, is it reasonable to hypothesize that VT ablation should be performed early, maybe at the time that the patient presents with ventricular tachycardia and you're thinking about putting in ICD? Do you do a VT ablation at the same time? There are three studies that looked at that. I will just mention two of them. The SMASH VT study, these are patients with ischemic cardiomyopathy who presented with ventricular tachycardia or syncope and inducible VT. So they are indicated for an ICD. But before they put in the ICD, they got randomized. One group got the ICD, the other group got substrate modification VT ablation and got the ICD. And what was the outcome at a follow-up? The group who had VT ablation with substrate modification had a reduction and a decrease in ICD shock, but there was no effect on survival or mortality. Even though the numbers are not large enough to be able to draw any conclusions, there was no effect on mortality. The Berlin VT, similarly, from Europe, um, looking at patients who presented with post-MI ventricular tachycardia, secondary prevention, they need an ICD, and those patients had ventricular tachycardia ablation and an ICD versus other patients who had an ICD without uh, VT ablation. The VT ablation was deferred for after, until the patients had three more VT, then they did the ablation. So do we need to do an ablation early at the time of presentation or defer the VT ablation for when the patient has recurrent VT? And what they found out is that actually there was no difference between an early intervention and the late intervention as far as mortality and hospitalization. But there was a difference in terms of a reduction in the number of ICD shock and the reduction in the VT uh, recurrence. Well, where do, where, what do the drug uh, play a role in uh, patients with recurrent VT who have uh, VT ablation. These are, if we have a patient who comes to the, who come to uh, our, our clinic who has I, an ICD and has recurrent VT despite being on, uh, say, amiodarone, do we just increase the medication or do we take that patient to the lab to do a VT ablation? This study looked at the randomization between an escalation drug therapy, like increase the dose of amiodarone, add mixolytine, switch medication, or take him for an ablation. And they found that actually the patient who had an ablation had a lower rate of the composite primary outcome of death, VT storm, and appropriate shock, but it was mainly driven by a reduction in VT storm and the number of recurrent ventricular tachycardia, and not because of a reduction in, in, uh, in death. So where are we now? Well, we need definitely better technology better technology such as um, tools that give us deeper lesions, such as needle ablation. There are some data about ethanol ablation, but they can give you a lot of collateral damage because you are also killing a healthy myocardium. Using hypotonic saline ablation during an open irrigation. Uh, using two catheters, especially on the septum, for bipolar uh, ablation from one side to another, but there's a limitation as to how much energy you can give. I know Dr. Shiv Kumar is going to talk to us about neuromodulation modulation and stellate ganglionic block in patients with ventricular tachycardia storm. There is more and more data coming on trying to define the scar by CT scan and by MRI and then taking the patient for radiation therapy without any catheters. The patient lies on the table, 14 minutes radiation therapy to the scar that is defined by MRI and by CT scan and see if that actually would work. Some of the initial data is very um, encouraging to that effect, and we are working uh, with uh, our imaging uh, people at the clinic in terms of trying to better define and image the scar so that we can have 
digital EP study, we can predict where the circuit of the VT is and target our ablation uh, accordingly. So in conclusion, I think that infarct scar related VT is the major cause of sustained v uh, monomorphic VT in those patients. We know that ICD are protective. Uh, not much has been done in terms of drugs for uh, suppression of ventricular arrhythmia. Uh, VT ablation reduces the recurrent VT and decreases ICD shock, but we do not have any effect on mortality as to this date. The optimal timing of VT ablation remains unclear. You can do it early, you can do it, you can defer it, maybe because it's a limitation of the tools and what have you. I think that ablation technologies have improved uh, to warrant early consideration, but we need still further improvements, such as I said, maybe with the stereotactic uh, body radiation and future advances in understanding the substrate, defining the optimal ablation targets, and improved ablation technology are needed so that we can improve our outcome and offer this early on for our patients. Thank you very much.